for message one. Thanks, David. It's good to see all of you saints. Um, may we start with a brief word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you for gathering us together this weekend once again into your name, and that is into your dear, dear person. We love you. We cherish you. Lord, we're here to hold you and also to exalt you. We pray, Lord, in this gathering, in unity, in the oneness of the spirit of the saints and of all the churches, we would be here actually experiencing the running anointing oil on the head of Aaron, over his beard and all the way to the hems of his garment. We're here to also experience the dew that descend from the high place, the heavenlies of Hermon, upon the mountains of Zion in all your local churches. Lord, thank you for this running oil, the all-inclusive compound life-giving spirit, the greatest blessing that you give have given to us. Thank you, this spirit is all supplying, so rich and so sweet. Lord, anoint us all in this meeting from beginning to end. Lord, we thank you also for that dew that descend upon us, so gentle, so refreshing, the grace of life, the portion of the saints. Thank you, Lord. We're here throughout the whole time, whether speaking or we're listening. Lord, we're here to enjoy the anointing spirit and also, oh, the grace of life. We pray that you would bless us all this whole weekend, every session, and every single saint with yourself in this kind of a way. Lord, we can never forget that besides you, there's still an enemy here, which we would bind in your powerful and victorious name. We bind Satan, we cast him out, we give him no ground, no room whatsoever, in these meetings to bother us. Lord, we pray that everything would be full of your perfect peace. Lord Jesus, we tell you again, we love you. Do speak with us and do speak in us. Do be one spirit with us. And even to listen and receive this message with us. Lord, we say hallelujah. Bless today's time with all of us here. Amen. Okay, uh, dear brothers and sisters, um, uh, you have the outline, I assume, uh, in front of you, at least outline number one. And uh, uh, of this uh, five session conference uh, this weekend. And uh, I like to actually take some time in the beginning to tell you the burden that is on my heart for this time, and also the source and the of these material that you are receiving in the form of outlines and uh, even some ministry excerpts. They're all from this book this, uh, in my library, and it is called simply How to Meet, How to Meet. And I would absolutely recommend that you would get this book or you go to ministrybooks.org and read this book. Whatever you do, I highly recommend it. Now, it is not a uh, particularly short book. Uh, it has a total of 23 chapters. But trust me, uh, you will not go wrong in getting into um, uh, this book and also to read it carefully and thoroughly after this conference, especially if you have not done so before. For those who have read it, I highly recommend that you would read it again. Now, this is where I would begin my speaking today, and that is this book. 
and the messages contained therein. They were given in two informal trainings or informal spring trainings back in the year 1969 and 1970 in Los Angeles. Um, and it, uh, those times, those years meant a lot to me because it was exactly in February of 1969 that I migrated. I moved to Los Angeles to jump into and to enjoy my church life until now. Until now, this is uh, over, what, uh, 50 years. And so I'm a bit sentimental here. But uh, I cannot forget those days. And it so happened that those years, 69, 70, uh, are milestone years in that they were the peak of the church life there in so-called Eldon Hall in L.A., I would actually, being a student of history, and particularly the history of the Lord's recovery, and even more particularly, the history of those early years in L.A., the start of the Lord's recovery in the USA. Um, Brother Lee would uh, actually call those years, 6970, the peak years, in LA, and even elsewhere, he would say those were the years of revival. Now, I was there myself experiencing that firsthand, and I did my uh, pretty thorough uh, uh, study of the history of those times. And even beyond that time, and of course, I have been in the recovery since then. So not only I would quote Brother Lee here to say that, to say these things, I would like to personally tell you with great conviction uh, through much study that those were indeed years of a classic, genuine church revival. You have to notice even in the Lord's recovery, the Lord's recovery by next year, or some people consider this year, would be 100 years. The Lord's recovery among us, beginning with Brother Watchman Nee, and then Brother Lee, and then now with us. 100 years, not a short time. In the years, starting with Brother Watchman Nee, all the way to uh, Brother Lee, um, in those uh, First, what should I say, two-thirds or three-quarters um, length of this hundred years, there were revivals among us. You say, well, we are the Lord's recovery. What, why do we need revivals? Well, the fact of the matter is, like Habakkuk the prophet prayed, Revive the work of your hands in the midst of these years. There is always an aspiration and a desire and indeed a need of God's people to be periodically revived. To be revived, meaning that they somehow descended or degraded or fell into a less than revived condition. And so they pray for that. They long for that. And the Lord in his mercy and grace would grant that from time to time. This is the case in the church with a capital C in the last 2,000 years in the church history. And this is also true even in our own history, in the Lord's recovery amongst us. So Brother Lee would say, up to that point, and that is around 1970 or so, that we have experienced several uh, revivals. The first one was when the recovery started 
in China in the 20s. And there would be another revival in the 30s under the ministry of Watchman Nee. And then there would be yet another revival in the early 40s under the work of Brother Witness Lee in his hometown in northern China, in his this place called Qifu. And then after that, there would be a fourth revival that would take place in the late 40s, 1940s. And that would take place in starting with Shanghai in China, and then it would spread throughout the country in China, resulting in great multitudes of uh, people that were saved and brought into the church life and also in the spread of the local churches in that country. Of course, it was at that time that the political environment changed. And so as a result, Brother Li was sent out of the mainland of China to this place called Taiwan. And there, uh, and Brother Ni and other co-workers stayed behind and of course, the rest was history. And through Brother Lee's uh, migration to Taiwan, the Lord's recovery, the flame, the testimony of the Lord's recovery was kept alive and continued. And there he was in Taiwan for 10 years. And at the end of that time, the Lord burdened him and led him, in brief, to move to this country, the USA. And so in the very early 1960s, he began his ministry and his work of the Lord's recovery there in Los Angeles. And from that point on, he labored in Los Angeles to build up a model church life. By 19, the end of that decade, in the years that I'm talking about, during which time these messages on how to meet were given, the church life has ascended to a peak state. And there was a revival among us. Now, we're not here talking when we say revival, the Pentecostal type, you know, you know what I'm saying. Some, some uh, dropping down of the Holy, of the Spirit, uh, people speaking in tongues, or that sort of thing. No. What is a genuine revival? A genuine revival is simply when God's people put into practice, they work out, they live out what they receive as a revelation from God. When that happens, that is the breaking out of a revival. So revival has a lot to do with practice, not only of revelation and vision, but of the working out of those, the vision and the living out of that revelation by God's people. And that is exactly what happened. And by the way, I would like to put a footnote here for our help. And that is, brothers and sisters, you have to realize the ministry of the Lord, the Lord's ministry, whether through his servants and nowadays through the, the Lord's workers, co-workers amongst us. These ministry is to pass on the truths, uh, the riches, the revelation, the vision in the divine revelation that is the word of God. And these are tremendously important to us. It gives us direction. It gives us instruction. But 
the ministry can only present these things to us, the saints, the churches. The purpose, or rather, the obligation or responsibility of all of us, the saints, the churches, towards this ministry is not only to appreciate it or to support it. It is, in fact, to work it out. It is, in fact, to live it out. This is our obligation. And so that happened in those years, in the 60s. Um, I was there again. All the things that Brother Lee spoke were not just put into books. In fact, in those days, we didn't have many books to speak of. Very few, unlike today, look behind me and look at some of your bookshelves. But I tell you this, whatever he spoke, the saints had the grace and the burden to right away put them into practice. And it is that practice that brought about a revival. A revival. Today, I would like to say this principle remains as we read the books, as we listen to the ministry. I hope, brothers and sisters, we would have a burden, not just to know these things, say amen to these things, which is wonderful, agree with these things. Let us have the heart and the spirit, another spirit like Caleb, to what? To work these things out. To practice these things. Recall what uh, uh, the Apostle Paul. He said, all these things that you have seen in me, that you have heard from me, that you have received from me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. Yes, I have passed these things on. I have spoken these things to you but you must now practice them. I hope even in this light, this weekend's speaking, which is not mine, which is really from the Lord's servant, we would have a heart to practice these things. We will not be contented with just knowing them or apprehending them. We would do them. Let us be not just hearers of God's word, but its doers. Then the word will be the living and operative word will be what? Effectual. In our personal lives, in the church life, and this will cause, will bring about the advance, the advance of the Lord's recovery among us. Now, quickly, back to the story of this book, how to meet, you know, Witness Lee later on said, the more you read this book, how to meet, the less you know how to meet. He was trying to make a point that this is not a book about methodologies. This is not a book about techniques. You know, this is not a book that tells you one, two, three, four, a program, how to meet. Like today, you go to Christianity meetings, it's programmed. You know exactly what's going to happen. That is a case of what formality? That is a case of ritualistic gatherings. And that is part of the degradation of the meetings of the church, the meeting of the Lord's believers. It has become a program thing. It has become a form. And as a result, these meetings are dead. These meetings are full of what? Full of just formalities. These meetings are not rich with the content of Christ. These meetings are not powerful in that it changes lives and advances God's economy. So we need to come to this book or even listen to this, these messages this weekend in another way. We're not looking for 
how to's really, even the book is how to. We're here rather looking to the Lord to open his word to us, that we would see certain principles, indispensable, God ordained, reveal in the scriptures. Oh, I tell you, as we get into it, I hope you would have your Bible open. And in, in between the sessions of this weekend, you'll be reading your Bible to study the references and the and the with the help of the outlines, just how great this matter is, the meeting of the church, the church meeting life. This is a great thing. And I will tell you, this is in the end, not just about meetings, you know, coming to meet and how to meet and what do we do and so on. I will tell you, that the meetings of the church, the meetings of the church, this is not just the meetings of a bunch of believers. This is not even just the meeting of Christians. We're talking about the meetings of the church, the church meetings in a locality, in a local church. How this has so much to do even with God's New Testament economy. Now, I'd like to now uh, get into this outline with you because I already have actually <laughs> gone over myself a lot of time in my speaking. I told the brothers that I would like to keep my messages to one hour. Looks like I'm going to fail already in this first session. You forgive me. And uh, please follow along. So this weekend, I collapsed the various chapters in this book into these five outlines, at least half of this book. And as I'm getting into these things myself again, I am more deeply burdened, more burdened than ever about the need of revival in our meeting life, in the church meetings. Let's look at this outline here. <clears throat> Meeting on the position of the church in church consciousness. So I would like to tell you the first principle of the New Testament meetings of the Lord's believers is in fact, what? A church consciousness. Church consciousness. We're not even here talking about even what to do in the meetings, how to prepare for the meetings. What do we say? What do we sing in the meetings? No, we're not talking about how many kinds of meetings there are, and there would be many kinds of meetings and all that. We have to start with this matter of the church. And that's why I have a sing 852, one of the, I feel the best hymns by Brother Lee, especially on the matter of the church. And this hymn does not have that much truth. This hymn is full of feeling, full of sentiments of one who had fallen in love with God's dwelling place, which is his, the Lord's blessed church today. I won't get into this hymn. I hope tonight after the meeting, we would sing this hymn again and go to sleep with this song. I want this song as it does every time I sing this song, it just evoke within me a deep 
love, a deep cherishing, a deep care for the Lord's church. The church is the Lord's. It says what? He, Christ, loved the church. This is in Ephesians 5. And gave himself for her. Just reflect on that well-known verse again. Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Brothers and sisters, when we talk about the meeting life, the first thing is about the church. What is our attitude towards the church? How conscious we are of the church of God. How much do we see the importance of the church in the Lord's heart? How much we also love the church as he does. You see, if you don't care about the church, you don't love the church to this degree, you wouldn't, you wouldn't care about the church meetings. You wouldn't prioritize the church meetings. It's not just about going to a meeting. Well, yes, we're, we're in the church life. We go to the meeting, we meet. No, no, no. It goes much deeper than that. We love the church. The church of God, the church of Christ, the church of the saints. We love this church, the Lord's body. This, is, this church is everything to him, so this church is everything to me. It is my life. It is my living. The Lord would lay down his life, give himself on the cross to purchase this church for himself, to redeem it to himself. For her, the writers say here, I forsake myself that she would be filled with you. I would consecrate myself, not only to Christ, but also to his church. I love the church. I hope there would be a revival of love for the church, the local church, the church where you are. Then, if we have this kind of feeling, oh my, I just want to be with the church all the time. I want to meet. I want to just, this is just my existence. The church meetings is not a thing, a place, a, a occasion that I choose to attend or not attend. I belong there. That's my life. I cannot survive. I cannot live without the church, without the church meetings. And here, I would just say this, and we must know this, and that is the word church, ecclesia in Greek. What does that mean? You know, this word church is some kind of old English word. It means nothing, church. But it has become traditional. It is the popular word. So we also use the word church. Actually, the meaning of this is ecclesia. Ek means what? Means the called, to call. And kaleo means what? Uh, the gathering, the, the, the coming together. So, this word means the gathering, the assembly of the call out ones. The called out ones. This is what it means. So the 
brethren, I'm talking about the British brethren, <clears throat> they don't call themselves the church. They call themselves assembly, the assemblies, the local assemblies, the assembly in Bethesda, the assembly in Plymouth, the assembly in, 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 in Dublin or whatever it is. And that is correct. That is accurate. The church is not a cathedral. The church is not a chapel. The church is not a meeting hall. The church is not a denomination. The church is not an organization. The church simply means ecclesia, an assembly of the called out ones. And in this locality, in that city, we are the assemblies of the Lord. We are the called out ones that are gathered together. That's the church. That's the basic meaning of the church. And this implies that we are people that do not belong to this earth. We've been called out from it. We have nothing to do with the world. We have been called out of it. We are a transfer people out of that kingdom of darkness into another kingdom. We're separated from all of that unto God, unto the Lord. We are the sanctified people. We're the called out ones. But not only so, we were called out to what? To gather together. So, the meetings is not just meetings. It is what we are. We are a meeting. We are the assembly. We are the gatherings of the called out ones. We live this way. If you are in this city, you are the assembly of that city. You are the called out ones in that city to gather together with another purpose, for another reason, living a different kind of life, bearing a different kind of a expression, enjoying a different thing. Now, let us now go to the this, uh, this outline. One, we must realize that we Christians are a meeting people. All right? This is just such a wonderful, direct, clear, definite statement. We Christians are a meeting people. We, 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 we're saved to meet. We call out to meet. Isn't this something? Not to go to heaven, all right? We're not saved to go to heaven. We're saved to meet. In fact, we're in heaven already. The meetings of the church is heaven. Is it heaven to you, brothers and sisters? We are a meeting people. Someone said, we are not butterflies. We are bees. Butterflies, you just kind of... Flitter around all by yourself, independently, individualistically. Bees, they just kind of, whoa, they're just together all the time. We are a meeting people. A Christian is a meeting person. We are a meeting person. We're programmed that way. We're saved to be like this. The life within us is a meeting life. We're uncomfortable. We're sad. We feel something is amiss when we don't meet. We feel this is wrong. This is automatic. This is natural. This life that we have received through regeneration. It's an ecclesia life that we have received. Without meeting, there is no Christian life and no church life. Can we say this? If we don't meet, there's really no Christian life to speak of. Absolutely, there's no church life to speak of. You say, well, I'm still a Christian. Yes, you are still a Christian. But I'm talking about a normal Christian life. 
We are members of Christ. We're saved to become part of his body. Organically, we're joined to one another, just like we join to the Lord himself. And our existence, our Christian existence, is that way. It is not a Lone Ranger existence. It's not an independent existence. We are, our, our existence happen, happen in the context of the church and the assembly. And needless to say, the church life, if we don't meet, where is the church life? There's no such thing. B, it's difficult for any Christian to grow without attending the meetings. Now, some people would argue, no, I, I read the Bible, I pray, I, 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 I fellowship with the Lord, I, I, I'm growing. Well, I would not say that is wrong. But for us who have the experience in the church life in a proper way, I would say it, was, it will be difficult. I wouldn't say it's impossible. I would say it's difficult to grow. Put it another way. Put it another way. When we attend the meetings, when we're in the meetings, we're meeting with the saints and with the Lord, of course. We'll get into all of that. I tell you, we grow. We grow. The, the, this is just a, a fact. When I don't attend the meetings, when I'm not with the saints, something is really, really missing. The food, the water, the supply, the spirit, the life, so many riches of the triune God, the dispensing of the triune God. All of this is greatly, greatly reduced when I'm not in the meetings. And there's no way for any Christian to serve God without meetings. That's true. Actually, you know, today in the Christian realm, they say they call meetings service, right? The Sunday morning service. Well, we don't say it. But in another way, there's some truth to that. I tell you, the highest service we can render to God as his people is to meet, to worship him. We will see a lot of this later on. We serve the Lord in the meetings. Do you have this concept? We don't go to the meetings just to do this or do that, to listen to this and that. We go to the meetings to serve God, to worship God. And it is impossible for Christians to express Christ if there are no meetings. That's true. If in your church or in your locality, there is no meetings, there's no expression of Christ. But very little, maybe individually here and there. But as far as the corporate, powerful expression, it's not there. My, <clears throat> when there are rich, living, vital meetings, I tell you, Christ is expressed. You know, in 1 Corinthians 14, it says, even the unbeliever, when they come, they will bow down and say, God is among you. He won't bow down to one person, but in the presence of an assembly, filled with Christ, filled with the word of God, filled with the exercise of the spirit, filled with the life of the Lord, I tell you, it is convincing. It is subduing. It is enlightening. It is supplying. That's the expression of Christ. So whatever meetings we may have in the church, 
there should be the expression of Christ there. We come together, let us exhibit Christ. See, the church life is a meeting life. The church life is a meeting life. We should not build up a custom of not meeting, but a custom of meeting all the time. Now, you all know those verses in Hebrews chapter 10, 24, 25, especially. Paul was speaking to these waffling and affected Jewish believers who was, were drawn back to the old Jewish communal religious life. And Paul says, do not forsake the assembling of yourself together. So much the more as we see the day approaching. By removing themselves from the church meetings in those days, in effect, these Jewish believers are leaving the way of God's economy. The way of God's economy is very practical. It depends on where you meet, how you meet. They went, if you go back to the temple and start offering the bulls and goats, burning the incense and doing all those things, you are in a diff wrong dispensation. The New Testament believers, they left all those things. They have a different way of meeting, not with all those entrapments, not with all those rituals, not with all those ordinances, all those religious things. They met day to day, house to house. They met with the living Christ as the life-giving spirit within them. They met without formalities and programs. They met with the Lord's dear presence. And as we will see, they met with the resurrected Christ for the ascended Christ. They met to be what? To experience the dispensing of the triune God. They met to build up the body of Christ. Their meeting worked out God's economy, New Testament economy. Number two, we need to know the position of the church. And these things here, I may not have to spend that much time. I hope that you can spend more time in it. We need to know the important position of the church when we talk about meetings. In the entire New Testament, the first place that mentions something regarding the meetings of the believers is Matthew 18. So we have to go back to Matthew 18. You know, in Matthew 16, the Lord first unveiled the church that he was to build upon his, the revelation of himself as the Christ, the son of the living God, I will build my church. That refers to what we call the universal church. But two chapters later in Matthew 18, the church is mentioned the second time by the Lord. This time, the church is not that universal church so-called. This time, the church is a local church because it says that if there would be one who would not heed the fellowship of the believers, go tell it to the church. It's a practical church. It's a local church. It's a church on the earth in a place. That is in Matthew 18. And we need to know that chapter because in this chapter, the meetings of the church was talked about. And even the promise 
by Emmanuel, God with us, that I will be with you when two or three are gathered together into my name. When it talks about the two or three praying, binding and loosing on the earth what has been bound and loosed in the heavens. In that context, the church was mentioned. Now, I would just read these points. In, in verse 15, the Lord said that if a brother sins against you, you must go to him and do whatever you can to recover him. If he will not listen to you and will not listen to two or three, then you must bring the case to the church. I'm here emphasizing that church consciousness. Two, this must be the local church, practical local church, the church on this earth, the church in a place, the church in the locality where you are. You know, brothers and sisters, when we say we love the church, we should say we love the church where I am. Don't say I love the church in that state over there. I don't care for my church here. Well, you can, that's not practical. That's not practical. It says here, if the offending brother neglects to listen to the church, the result is that he will be considered by the church like a Gentile and a tax collector. It is serious. The church administration, the church's decision, the church's feeling is a very serious matter because the Lord has committed himself and his authority to his church. Three, this tells us that we need the church and we need to be in the church. We should not consider ourselves so spiritual and so heavenly while neglecting to hear the church. God has chosen us, his people, to be in the church. We are chosen before the foundation of the earth to be part of the Lord's body, the fullness of the one who fills all and in all. But practically, practically, we are called out, called out to, from this world to be part of the church to be in the church. Some people do not have this kind of church consciousness. They, they just are independent Christians. But we are church conscious. We must be. God has chosen us, his people, to be in the church. God has no intention of choosing a myriad of individuals, but to choose a collective corporate people as the body of Christ. We know this. Because we all have been born again and have the life of God within us, we are part of the church in nature. But in position, we may be outside of the church. All the believers are part of the church of God. But not all in position, in practical experience in practical position are in the church today. This is a great part of the Lord's recovery. That is to recover the practical church life. When we are outside of the church, really, in reality, we are just like a Gentile. And number six, it is a serious thing not to be in the church. Now, I don't have the time. You may want to go to Leviticus 25, 29 and read that footnote. And I won't, I won't tell you what that is. I don't have the time. But here is one sentence that our brother have to say. He said, losing the enjoyment of the church is more serious than losing the enjoyment of Christ. Oh, have you heard that? He said this, because the Lord is gracious, it is easy for us to recover our enjoyment of him. However, it is more difficult and requires a longer time to recover the loss church life. And there is this, this footnote here, talk about 
someone selling the house in the city. And that house typifies the church, expressed as the local churches in many cities. And if you don't redeem it within one year, you will lose it permanently. And the point is made here to lose in this type, to, with the, to lose your house is equivalent to for a believer to lose the enjoyment of the church life. And that loss can be mitigated. It can be restored, but only in a short period of time, the time of God's grace, indicated by one year time, one year time limit. And then he went on to say that if we lose the enjoyment of the church life, uh, that in this age of grace, we will still lose it in the age of the millennium, the age of the kingdom. This is quite a serious matter. I'll leave this to you. Dear brothers and sisters, let us not lose the church life. Let us not lose the enjoyment of the church life. Let us not lose the meeting life of the church, it is a very serious matter. B, if we would meet properly, our meeting must be related to the church and our meeting must belong to the church. We have to check, we're meeting, we're even meeting with Christians, but is this a meeting related to the church or belong to the church? Right? <clears throat> or is it a meeting in a divisive way, in a way of division? One, some use Matthew 18.20 to justify any meeting where two or three are gathered in the Lord's name. But they neglect the context of this verse. The context tells us that the meetings of the believers must be something of the church, something which takes the stand of the church. When we meet properly on the position of the church, I tell you, that means a lot. Administratively, in God's administration. And also meeting in this kind of way, that is in the way on the ground of oneness. All right? Meeting as that is ordained by the Lord in God in Deuteronomy in a place that he has chosen, the place that he has put his name there, in this place of unity, of oneness, like what is said in Psalm 133. When we meet in this way, <clears throat> we will be automatically, dear brothers and sisters, be under his blessing. The blessing of life will be ours. This is not a small matter. <clears throat> All right. There are many examples in the book of Acts in which the believers met in homes. We also meet in homes. We promote the home meetings, the small group gatherings, very much. Yet what they were doing in their meetings was simply carrying out what the church in Jerusalem intended and decided. So whether it's small meetings, whether it's home meetings, whether it's group meetings, all of that, all of our meetings must be part of the church, must have the right standing of the church, and must carry out the church's decision and intention and burden. This is the right way to meet. Number three, the proper way to meet is to meet either as part of the church or as the church, right? Depending on the size of the meetings and how and where we gather. If the whole church comes together, we meet as the church. If it's not possible for the entire church to come together, we must meet in different places, right? In a big city. But we are still meeting as parts of that one church. 
This matter has very much to do with the oneness of the body, a very, very important thing. When you talk about the church meetings, the first principle is meeting in oneness. On the ground, the genuine ground of oneness, to preserve the oneness of the spirit, to display the oneness of the Lord's testimony. Whether it is a small group, whether the whole church comes together, whether we're in homes, we're in the meeting hall, it must be on the standing of the church. Whenever we meet, we must meet for the church. For the church. We meet for the building up of the church. We meet to execute the burden of the church. That means that we're absolutely one with the church and that there can be no divisions. In this way, our meetings will be kept in the church in oneness. So I think this is very clear. Don't be careless about this. We have to be very, very exercised and careful to what? To always meet in a way that is one with the church where we are. A very, very serious thing. Now, I actually don't have the time to get into this Roman 3. This Roman 3, I would beg you to get into these things, a wonderful uh, collection of verses in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, proving the point from their account, from the stories from the scriptures of how the early Christians met. And to use, quote, our brother's word, they did not meet in a churchless way. They didn't just meet as believers, which they were, or just Christians, which they were, and sometimes as a group of apostles and teachers, which they were. Or prophets. But if you read these verses again, so impressed, so impressive, all their meeting has the church in view. It's always part of the church. It's always in the church. It's always for the church. It's never churchless. It's never for some work, for some person. It's always in the context of the church when we talk about meetings. And that's how the early believers met. And so uh, let me just uh, uh, read A, and then I will jump to the end. Okay? There are many Christians today that are churchless. Those who attend them have no concept whatever of the church. So their meetings are not church-related or church conscious. Number one, strictly speaking, if we know the word of the Lord, we will realize that to meet in a churchless way is actually sin. Whoa, isn't this a very, very strong word? Rightly so. It's sinful in the eyes of God to meet in a churchless way, in the wrong ground, taking the wrong position. Because if, you meet, if we meet without paying a due attention to the church, we're meeting in a divisive way. God's purpose is to build up a body for his son. If we meet without keeping the oneness of the church, we're damaging the body of Christ by our meetings. We all must be exceedingly clear that whatever, whenever we meet, we must be church conscious. I jump over point B. Let's come to C as a conclusion. In these last days, may we learn to be church conscious. This matter is almost totally related to the meetings. This is the first principle we must learn for our meetings. We must meet in a church way. So I stop here. And I would just like to uh, say this as a summary to refocus us. 
that when we talk about our meetings, the first thing is we must talk about the church. We must be rightly related to the church. We must meet as the church. We must meet in the church, and we must meet for the church. We must meet on the ground of the church, which is the ground of oneness. And when we meet in this way, when we meet in this way, we're right with God. We're right with the Lord. We're right with his administration. And in this way, meeting in this position, brothers and sisters, oh, I tell you, the Lord's commanded blessing will be with us, even life forevermore. And that's why I prayed with Psalm 133 earlier, the flowing ointment, the descending dew, are reserved, reserved for what? For the mountains of Zion, the local churches. This, uh, this blessing of life is reserved for what? This commanded blessing of life for those in the place of unity, in the place of the church. So I would just stop here. Amen. Brother David.